excited when you were asking me that question because I really think sky is the limit. We've been working so hard. I mean, that like we've just been trying to tackle a problem from upside down, backwards, right, left, just trying to figure out how to raise awareness. But all of a sudden, this train, it's like all of a sudden, it's like, it's really moving. We met with NIH last, was it, what is that, in DC two weeks ago after the premiere launch for the PBS. And we met with like bipartisan uh, support people and really asking for a hefty amount for funding and raising awareness. And people are really interested at this point, you know, they want us to be part of like decision making, like the four of us who were there. So um, I, I honestly don't see an end in what we can achieve. Like, I just think the future seems so bright. I hope in my lifetime that people are diagnosed by pediatricians and there's a lot that needs to be done. We need enough surgeons. How are we going to meet the need of these 200 million who have end up? Welcome to I Care Better, Endo Unplugged, where we talk about all things endometriosis. I'm your host, Jandra Mueller, pelvic floor physical therapist and integrative nutritionist. This is a very special episode for me because Dr. Orbach really is the person who opened my eyes to this disease, what it is, what it is not. I started working with her in 2016, 2017 in Los Angeles when I was at our location in West LA. And she was incredibly supportive in my own journey with endometriosis. I had a bit of, I don't want to say unique symptoms because so many people have unique symptoms, but I was not convinced despite you know, hindsight being 2020, that this was something that was going on with me. And I didn't know her very well at that point, but she was incredibly helpful in answering my questions and giving me a deeper understanding as to why this was probably endometriosis after so many doctors could not explain to me what was happening in my body and what was going on. It just felt very personal to ask for help. And she was so great in answering all of my questions and went above and beyond, not just to answer my questions, but also to provide a deeper understanding as to why this, why she was so certain that this was actually what was going on in my body. And that was such a game changer for me and has led me to be where I'm at in helping others with this disease and has pointed me in the direction of gaining my own understanding. And it's been such a pleasure to work with her and learn from her. And not only is she an excellent surgeon, she really understands the integration of so many factors that come with endometriosis. She works with an interdisciplinary team to manage pain, to address gut dysfunction, to talk about lifestyle changes. And she not only does this with her patients, but she definitely practices what she preaches with her and her family. And I'm so excited for her to be on and to share what she has to offer with everybody listening. So so with that, I'm very excited to have this conversation with Dr. Orbuck and share it with everyone. So let's talk about endo. There's so many places I want to start with you, actually. And I think logically, it makes sense to just talk a little bit about you. I think many people know who you are and what you do because you've been such a huge advocate in endometriosis. Those people who do not know who you are, can you just share a little bit about you, what you do, and your philosophy of care? Sure. First of all, I'm so honored to be here with you, Jandra. So um, I'm Dr. Iris Karen Orbach. I'm the author of Beating Endo, How to Reclaim Your Life from endometriosis and I'm an endometriosis excision specialist and an endometriosis patient and a mom of a daughter with endometriosis and my approach is really a holistic multidisciplinary east meets west approach to helping those who are suffering with endometriosis I'm passionate about it love it really trying to raise awareness change the narrative and get help to those who are suffering. And, you know, I won't stop until we're diagnosed in a timely fashion with great surgery, great PT, multidisciplinary approach. And um, it's just been so uh, fun um, paving this road. I was saying that this is a special episode for me, like from a personal level, because 
I think it was in 20, 2016 when you moved to LA, tw- maybe early 2017 when mm-hmm. we were introduced and working together when I was in our Los Angeles office. And hindsight is always twenty twenty, and I should have put the pieces together, but I think I reached out to you in email. I was very hesitant and you really opened my eyes to what this disease is, what it's not, and really in detail about how the GI specifically, I think I was sharing with you, you know, how this could be connected and and the reasons. And it was probably that email or conversation we had gave me more answers than the three years of doctors I had been seeing to figure things out. It just made sense. So I think your practice is also very special in the in the way that you run it, in the way that you approach the disease. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because while everyone wants surgery and wants it right away, and I'm sure that as a surgeon too, you know I can get in there and get all the lesions, but you have a way of practicing for a specific purpose that highlights your interdisciplinary care. So can you share about that? Yeah. So you know, the title of my book, Beating Endo, like that's really what I'm trying to help my patients do is beat it. And because of the diagnostic delay of eight to 10 years from symptom onset to diagnosis, what happens from the pain, all these other um, pain generators or other like hands on a hot stove that I like to call it, or byproducts because of having this inflammatory disease for nearly a decade, they get set in motion. So by the time someone comes to me, not only do they have suspected endo, but typically 99.9% of my patients have pelvic floor tight muscles. Um, Many have, I'm finding in my practice, about 80% or eight out of 10 of those coming in have some kind of like a bacterial overgrowth. Many have plenty of other pain generators that are happening. If they had anxiety or depression, it's worse. If they didn't have it, they have anxiety and or depression. I mean, who wouldn't going to, on average of, they say about, I think, uh, eight physicians over a course of a decade till they're diagnosed. So being told the pain's in their head, it's normal, it's part of being a woman. Um, So I just kept hearing these stories over and over and over after I finished my fellowship with um, Dr. Harry Rich and Dr. C.Y. Liu, two like amazing, amazing surgeon, amazing mentors. Uh, And I went into practice being like, oh, I can cut out endo. I can make people better. But what I kept seeing is, yeah, my surgeries were successful, but there was this commonality of these common symptoms that patients were describing over and over and over and over again, obviously different for everyone. And it made me just start, I'm an outside the box thinker. I've never lived my life in a box. Like if there's a box, I literally like am trapped in and I'm running away from that box. My brain does not work in a box. I don't know how I survived medical school, residency, fellowship, being in people's boxes. Um, But anyway, so my brain thinks in a very outside the box. And what I realized by the time someone came to me, not only did they have endo plus two to four or seven other conditions, there was also like a medical trauma. There was a distrust of physicians, you know, and during that time, also insurance was changing and really like providers have like seven minutes to figure out what's going on. And I was like, wait a minute, if I'm going to have truly helped someone and help them quote be endo, I need to understand their whole journey. Where did it begin? What happened along the way from a pain perspective, from what was utilized to try and help it? What happened with stresses? It could be losing jobs, you know, um, partner issues, family issues, a car accident. It could be, you know, getting hurt while skiing. I mean, there's there's so fell off my horse and you know hurt my tailbone. There's all these really significant parts to a history that's going to help me help the patient beat endo. So my approach was to really personalize the care. So any patient who comes to me, even if they have eight hours worth of medical records. I read them all prior to them walking foot and stepping foot in my office. So I know everything that came before me. And then I learned from my preceptors 
I basically say, you know, I've read through your records. I have a good sense of why you are here, but I want to hear your whole journey. Where did it begin? Start from the beginning and bring me to today. And I don't interrupt the patients unless I'm confused about something. Um, wait, what year was that? Because the timeline's not making sense. And then they're like, oh, that was my third surgery. I didn't tell you about the first and second or whatever. Um, in general, I'm not interrupting the patients. And I'm, I'm, for them, what I've realized, and me too, being a patient and again, being a mom of a daughter with endo, it is so validating to be heard and not interrupted. So I'm personalizing the care and I'm listening to them. I'm validating them. You know, I know a lot about medical trauma and trauma and anxiety and depression and the brain and the mind and every, not every, I'm always learning Eastern approach to everything. And I just, I've found that by listening, it helps me figure out the pieces of the puzzle that need to be implemented to help them, you know, beat the endo. And once, and then I explain things, I'm a visual learner. So I explain things in pictures. I explain things in terms that I would need, you know, like when I go to the doctor, I'm like, talk to me as a person. Don't talk to me as a doctor. I know I'm a doctor. Talk to me as if I'm not a doctor. Like I want to understand and I speak to people and I empathize. And if they're crying, I'm just going to give them their space to cry and let these tears come out. And, you know, patients are always like, I'm so sorry for crying. I'm like, don't ever say you're sorry in my office for crying. Like yeah. you have every reason to feel how you're feeling. I'm going to hold space for you. Just like that's, that's don't ever apologize. I don't say it in a, in a mean way. I'm like this, yeah. you know, like, like, unfortunately, societally, we as I, I, I identify as a woman. So I'm going to say me as a woman. It's like we're told to like be a man. And again, I'm saying I'm not trying to do stereotypes or anything. But like, no, we should have feeling and emotion that we've been going to a doctor for a decade or two decades or three decades, and told crazy stuff, you know, and invalidated and my space is a space in my office for patients to be seen, be heard, be listened to, and to feel like they're coming into um, like a totally different environment than a doctor's environment. Like we have crystals in our office. We have all sorts of, you know, it's very Zen and healing to me. And that's important to patients. I think one of the most consistent feedback I get from patients that we share is, I just felt listened to and the time that is spent with patients. And most of the tears are probably, yes, they can be just from retelling their story. But I, I think a lot of the tears are like finally being heard and, ha and happy tears for once, not yeah. just this is frustrating, although it, it very much is. But, but it is so important. And I think that environment sets up just a good conversation and feeling heard and feeling safe mm -hmm. and knowing that they're in the right place. Absolutely. Yeah. And my visits too are like at least an hour and a half long. So it's like, they're walking away with a plan of what to do. We have follow-ups, you know, four to six weeks afterwards. And then, you know, my staff is really friendly and kind. I just, everything from the person who's picking up the phone to the person who's checking them out for me, it's very important that it's not like an assembly line because we're human, we're people. So all of that from the call to the end is so important to me. Now, I don't know that I've ever asked you this before, but did you, from the fellowship and getting into endo, did you have to be in a kind of a standard practice before going out on your own and having that time instead of the, you know, the seven or eight minute rule where you're trying to get everything in and have 40 patients and yeah. So I knew from the beginning when I finished my fellowship, I knew I wanted to be in private practice and run my own show. I've had offers along the way to be heads of endometriosis departments at huge universities and I've turned them all down. And I knew I went into, I remember in order for me, cause I had no money when I started even to pay rent. So in order for me to even um, open my own office, I was working like in a clinic part-time 
uh, on, um, where was it, like 140 something and like the east side in New York, just staffing a general GYN clinic. Um, and like, that's what it took just so I could cover my rent and malpractice to be able to give the care that I wanted to give and that I felt was deserving of helping people. Because for me, I'd rather go be like a yoga teacher or open a gym it, or I'm going to give the care that I believe is necessary to help people. So I created a practice so that I can do that. And I learned along the way. Yeah. 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 And I think that there's one of the biggest complaints about that patients have good doctor, not good doctor is when doctors take insurance as good as they can be and wish or we know that some of them are, the system doesn't set up for that environment at all. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. You are very knowledgeable in a lot of these more, comp the more complexities that come with endometriosis, right? You see a lot of patients with Lyme disease or autoimmune mm -hmm. disease, MCAS, SIRS, whatever you want to call it, that's these sort of stealthy pathogens. How... How does their prognosis look with surgery and does that change how you manage them and when you want to intervene with surgery? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so often patients are coming to me unaware of all of these other underlying pathologies or, or entities that they have, but it's by me taking this really extensive history and it's like this clinical acumen that's ma having me ask these questions. I always ask uh, after we do general gynecological questions, you know, general overall health, um, gut questions, urological questions. I'm always asking about um, anxiety, depression, traumas, um, like kind of like a family history. And then there's something about the patients, like if they just seem like they're not detoxing well or based on the things that they're telling me, like they did this, or if their allergy list is like 18 items yeah. long, or their supplement list is 30 items long, because all of that is put in the EMR, electronic medical records before I even see the patient, and or what they list as other medical history, or the family, and I always ask a very extensive family history autoimmune disease history. And often I'll be like, did you ever live in a building with mold? Have you ever had mold exposure or bitten by a tick? And it could just be like someone talking about migrating joint issues. Like I had pain in my right knee and then my left ankle and my right shoulder, um, or just utter fatigue or there, there's just hints that. So in those patients, I'll, I'll say, hey, you know, I think you've got endo. I think you've got tight muscles. We'll go through what I think. And I, but I, I really think that you may have um, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. So I'll refer them out. And then that doctor will start them on their way with that. I usually would do a follow up like four to six weeks later based on that finding, plus how they're doing in pelvic floor PT, based on how they're doing with all of this other stuff that I've given them. That then guides when do I get them to surgery? So they always ask me at the first visit, when can I have surgery? And I said, listen, if I'm a surgeon who just cared about making money, I would schedule you for surgery next week. I said, I am a doctor who cares about helping you beat endo. And often the more prehab you do at the beginning, that is the shorter time to overall getting better. So I, and I, I tell them, I promise there's no financial, in it's a disincentive to me to do what I'm doing, right? Um, and only then they're like, oh, okay, then they, they buy into it, but I'm being honest. And then, then I say, listen, my daughter had endo too. Do you think I had her do pelvic floor PT? Yes, I did. Jandra, you did PT on Alexandra, right? You were her first PT. Do you think I had my daughter do integrative nutrition? You bet I did. Do you think I had her do acupuncture? Yes, I did. Do you think my daughter meditates? You bet she does. Like, and so she did all of this stuff before she had surgery. So I say, and so, and I say to them, if I'm having my daughter do it, like, like, yeah, you believe in it. 
I believe in it and it works. So yeah. I think once I personalize it, cause it's true. I think cause they understand that I identify, I understand it all. So in those patients who do have SIRS, who do have MCAS, I try and at least calm that stuff down beforehand. What I have found most recently, like the ones who are just, they're like, I can't, they're so responsive to everything. I've really found that their recoveries are a nightmare because they're going into surgery like literally whatever's running rampant an underlying infection or underlying mold is causing them to be responsive immune response to everything so if surgery in general causes an inflammatory response imagine how that would be if you have a heightened response going into surgery because then your central nervous system's totally on fire before you're going into surgery and the the post op period is eventually they do calm down from a pain yeah. uh, calm I mean their body calms down from an inflammatory perspective from a pain perspective and they all do but it's it's like torture for for me to watch all of that that could be averted if there was more work done on the front end you know but everyone's got different yeah. things like I'm starting school in the fall I'm um, there, there's all, di- I'm moving. There's all different reasons why we accelerate surgery and don't go at that ideal plan. There's some people I work with for two years yeah. and then I operate. Um, and there's some people where they're fertility patients and they don't have two years and we yeah. need to just really get them in, at least get that inflammatory, um, like the inflammation out of them. So then they can freeze their eggs or then freeze embryos. Um, everyone does so much better, the more, um, the less inflamed they are and the more of their hands on the hot stove, like that are lifted going into the surgery. Those are my patients who do the best and they take between zero and two narcotics. Yeah. I was going to highlight that is because you were in post-op pain and a lot of people who have a good excision surgery, it's so interesting to hear them describe coming out of surgery and they're like, I feel so much better. It's it's like a night and day difference, but they can recognize what's post-op pain, which is productive pain in your body, right? You're, mm-hmm. you're under inflammation that is actually helping you heal. Mm-hmm. And, but they still will say like, there's something, I just feel so much better. And you almost have to hold them back. Like, remember you had surgery <laughs> and right. you don't push yourself too hard, yeah. but also then those that don't and their nervous system is so upregulated, they naturally, they're going to want to take pain meds, but then they're not, it's not the same type of pain. So they don't work on them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. What I found by implementing this multidisciplinary approach, I always ask my patients by the time we get to the pre-surgery appointment, which is usually a week or two before surgery, like what percentage better are you today compared to on our first consult? And very often I'm getting patients you know, at least 50% better, often 70% better before I operate on them. Yeah. Meaning I really, everyone's different. You know, some people really just have endo and like some tight muscles, it's very few patients. There are exceptions, but most of the patients are like the, the excision of the endo is that final piece of the puzzle to get them better. Yeah. I want to dive a little bit deeper into some of that because online, well, even as a somebody who underwent a master's degree in nutrition, I mean, really undergoing the endo experience, let's say it personally, I just learned so much and I wanted to learn more about it to better implement it to patients because there were certain aspects that were very helpful. Of course, right. there was aspects that were not. And it's not a one size fits all. And there's so much to diet, so much to using supplements, doing functional testing, all of that. And there's kind of a divide. And I think it comes down to the understanding of what is the purpose of doing this. And there's Mm -hmm. people that do use the language, you know, heal your endo naturally. And I think that's a misnomer. I want to just put that out there. Mm -hmm. But there is a purpose to it. Some patients, at least in my experience, and maybe in yours too, they don't see the full benefit until they also then add the surgery. And then they're like, wow, I'm so much better. 
But then there is other people who sort of say, you can't do that. There's nothing to this. And, you know, you just need surgery. And there's this whole spectrum, which I think there's some truth to in all of it. But can you describe a little bit more of the things that you find are most helpful and and tie it more into specifically with endo and why it's purposeful? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. So I really do believe that the gut is the brain of the body. You know, we know, don't quote me on this, but like, wasn't it yeah. 75 or 85% of the serotonin comes from the gut? We now know that autoimmune diseases come from the gut, MS, Parkinson's, all, all autoimmune diseases, or many, I, don't, I kind of want to say, I never speak in all or none, but yeah. um, in general, we know that someone's autoimmune disease gets turned on because of gut imbalance, you know, yeah. Of, of the of the gut flora, small intestine, large intestine. Um, and I really, really, that's the one thing that I've done totally differently since I moved my practice from New York City to here. I was by coastal for maybe two years or so, but mm -hmm. um, maybe it's six years, seven years, or I'm entering year seven, something like that. And the one absolute difference that I've done is really, really strongly suggesting that patients work with an integrative nutritionist. And I will tell you, my patients, and I'm, I think I'm operating the same, um, so it's, I don't think my surgical skills are that much better year 14 or 13 versus year eight, 19 or whatever the difference is. Um, maybe I'm a slightly better surgeon, right? But it's the integrative nutrition piece because what's happening, people are, the, the problem is endo. So the symptoms often are very insidious and very slow onset, right? So parenthetically, I can ask someone, you know, if I ask the question, I don't ask the question this way. Are you constipated? You know, how is your gut? How are your bowels? Oh, great. Great. I don't ask a question like that. because I'm not going to get the answer I want. Yeah. I will ask them. Or they'll they'll be like, no, I don't have any issues. And I'll say, well, how many days do you go, you know, without having a bowel movement? What's the longest you've gone? Because I've read their x-ray or their MRI or whatever. It's like, you know, dilated loops of bowel, you know, excessive stool burden, you know. So I know there's tons of stuff. And they're like, no, I'm like, fine. Like I go every seven days. Sometimes I need an enema. I have to do, you know, I do a bottle of Miralax. Like, so, so people just don't even, they think that that's normal because they watch their mom doing that. And their mom usually has endo if they have the genetic link or um, they, they've been doing it for so long or just unbuttoning their pants or feeling bloated because it happens slowly. Like, oh no, that's just me. That's just how I am. That's how we women are. Or again, identifying women. I'm going to just say women in this case, but it's whoever has endo with a uterus. And, and it's, it's, um, and it was healing the gut. It's healing the body. And I find that my patients with um, bad anxiety or depression, the fixing of the gut allows them to turn the corner on their mental health aspect. And it's, it's unbelievable. unbelievable. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. Huge connection. I mean, they just changed the ICD 10 codes or ICD 11, whatever number we're on yeah. instead of IBS, they've changed it to disorders of the gut brain access because really? we have so much, Yeah. So DGBIs, ah. I think, is now the new terminology. I, don't, ah. I haven't really seen it implemented too much except sure. for one research article looking at abdominal phrenic dysynergia. But yeah, yeah it's, it's been exciting because of the research that's come out, which started slow, and we have a long way to go for <laughs> microbiome mm -hmm. research. But because of the strong connection and the research that keeps coming out supporting it they've they've changed that now instead of ibs it's disorders of the gut brain axis wow oh that makes me so excited i mean there's so much data out there on the gut and healing any autoimmune disease if you heal the gut it yeah. helps auto every autoimmune disease and it's out there this literature has been out there for over a decade and MDs are not, they still think that all this is woo-woo. There's nothing woo-woo about it, you know? Yeah. Yes. I I lied. It's not 
disorders of the gut brain axis. It's disorders of the gut brain interaction. I I believe okay. so. I'll put that in the notes. Okay. Uh, but they yes That's to highlight name. that. But yeah, of course, it's out there and it starts small and it builds and builds and we we now know so much more about that and it and it does make sense, you know. Oh, we just have these symptoms for over, you know, 6 weeks and there's the syndrome and it doesn't tell you anything. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and also I think that speaking about that, the understanding for me to explain to my patients that the more anxious someone is, the slower the transit of the gut is going to be. And then the more constipated one is going to be, the more likely you're going to keep having these overgrowths of bacteria and disordered gut. Um, So it's like, we don't want to just get SIBO tested and treat it with two weeks of antibiotics. We need to downregulate the brain gut connection by whether it's meditating or going for a walk or whatever it is to calm things down to then allow the gut to move in like a the nice forward propulsive manner it should move in and like we have to focus on all the different aspects yeah yeah I, I, and i always tell patients like i wish i could lie to you and say my surgery is going to fix your tight muscles i wish i could lie to you and say my surgery is going to fix your SIBO I wish I could lie to you that my surgery is going to do all of this stuff, but I'd be lying. Like I, 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 it's like, I wish it did all of that, but it doesn't. One question that they often have is well, what if I have to have a bowel resection? And it's like, you, you can have all of these things. And, and the majority of people do that have endo only a small percentage actually have bowel involvement where there needs to be a bigger surgery like that. Mm-hmm. Many mm-hmm. times it's, adhesions adhering it to the sidewall or or just the impact of inflammation altogether. Yeah. But it's not that because you have IBS symptoms that you have to have a bowel resection or it's invading your yeah. bowel. There was actually a really interesting study. I forget who it was. I could pull it up if you needed it. It's of those who have gut issues at the time of surgery, what percentage actually had endo on the bowel? It was like eight I'm trying to remember 8.4%. Okay. Like very few had it on the, it it could be inflammation on the uterus sacral ligament or in an area adjacent Mm -hmm. to it. And then the inflammatory effect and all the interleukins are affecting the gut. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really, you probably actually shared that article with me because this is the questions that I had with you and Mm -hmm. understanding what is going on. I did have SIBO, but Mm -hmm. I also, there was just this strange sense of constipation and it really made me understand the term dyskesia much better Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. I never had a name for that. And it's a very interesting feeling. And when, so we could talk about also your work up physical exam because Mm -hmm. you taught me that. And when you did that on me and you pressed right there, Oh my goodness, how Mm -hmm. excruciating that was. And it, and it was very validating to know mm-hmm. that in that posterior area, there was, that was what was causing obstruction in, in some mm-hmm. ways, right. Of, mm-hmm. of not mm-hmm. passing bowels. So mm-hmm. do you do imaging for everybody? I, I believe you send for ultrasound sometimes, but yeah. you, yeah. Can you talk about I, that? I always, usually people have all of this stuff by the time they yeah. come to me. I do want an ultrasound just to know, do they have an ovarian cyst? Cause I never want to put the laparoscope in and be like, Oh my God, I didn't know they have a yeah. mass because <laughs> I need to counsel yeah. people and I want to be prepared to, you know, a good outcome. So I like to know what I'm going to expect. But, um, so my physical exam literally starts before I even touch them. I'm observing how they're sitting in the chair are they hunched forward? Is it like one shoulder higher than the other? Are they keep moving around on their chair because they can't get comfortable? Um, are they lurching over on the desk like, <laughs> you know, um, like in this forward, pulling forward way? And then once I do the physical exam, I'm always examining like their core, their abdominal muscles, asymmetry. And then obviously like an internal exam. And then in the internal exam, I'm pushing on high yield areas of endometriosis, like the uterus sacral ligament, the cul-de-sac I'm identifying is the cervix, which should be positioned right in the center 
of like the, the, the vagina, like at its apex at the top, is it pulled to the right side or the left side, which usually indicates infiltration of um, the uterus sacral ligaments with endometriosis? Is the uterus pulled to the back, which is retroverted, which is normal variant, but many, I'd say most endo uteruses or uteri are retroverted. Is the uterus on an angle, which it often is because of the pulling or adhesions? Um, and then I'm pushing on, I'm trying to isolate out the uterus in and of itself. As I push on it, does that hurt? Because that could indicate endo in the muscle of the uterus known as adenomyosis. Then I'm assessing the muscles. Um, like, so, and then I'm assessing like the bladder area. So I'm trying to identify all different areas. For me, my physical exam helps me the most. But at, at this point, I honestly can ask the questions to get the answers that I know exactly what the physical exam is going to show me um, yeah. without with. And that's, that's why very often, even when I have patients who come from out of the country or across the country, for me, it, I can ask the questions to know exactly what the physical exam findings will be. Yeah. Somebody I recently heard talk about it was, I think it was a guy from the UK actually had mentioned, you know, if you ask the right questions, you can identify endo in, you know, 90 something percent of patients. And I, yeah. I really do truly feel that is true. Well, uh-huh. I do too. It's the, the easiest diagnosis to make yet. Like our American college of OBGYN says it, it baffles 83% of physicians or general practitioners. I think that was I'm not mistaken. Like they don't recognize the top, um, you know, yeah. symptoms. Of endo. It is so easy to make the diagnosis. I agree. And I think the longer now that I've been in this, it, it, it shocks me, but it doesn't shock me at the same time. Mm-hmm. And it's, mm-hmm. it's crazy. I, yeah, it's crazy. What made you want to get into endo? I played tons of video games as a kid and I'm like a big athlete. So for me, hand-eye coordination is like, you know, I was all Midwest in lacrosse as like a fresh freshman in high school. Like for me, the balls and hit, like everything was hand-eye coordination on you know, varsity basketball, varsity volleyball. And, um, and I played tons of video games. Like I always would, you know, I wouldn't really? stop that. Like one summer. Yeah. I had to save the princess and super Mario brothers so that's all hand-eye coordination. Yeah, that, that was like a whole summer to get oh to God, like I love that. save the princess. So I feel like I've always been drawn. There was actually a study that showed that pre-gaming with video games actually increases your accuracy of surgery. It was a study out of Beth Israel in New York by, um, oh, I'm forgetting the name of this doctor. Um, I can picture him. He actually taught me how to suture laparoscopically. Anyways, so that's kind of my traditional answer, but I... I the moment I walked into like the operating room and I saw an endometriosis surgery being done during my intern year, I like, this is where I belong. Like for me, it was trying to decide, do I do general surgery or do I do OBGYN when I was in medical school? I, I was very surgically oriented. I loved surgery, but then, and I chose o, OBGYN from day one. I hated the OB portion. It was literally like pulling teeth. For me to like even I just didn't enjoy it but I conversely I loved the um the operating and I love minimally invasive surgery and then you know had two amazing mentors who were at the end of their career who were unbelievable with me later on you had surgery which I would love mm-hmm. for you to talk about mm-hmm. but did you know that you had endo did you suspect this when did you suspect it I think the more I'm getting in touch with my intuition and my knowing, and I think there's like more, I really wonder if it was a subconscious knowing that Mm -hmm. this was going to be the key to me healing myself. And this was going to be the key to me healing my daughter, um, daughters, and just I really wonder if it was a subconscious knowing that I didn't know that it was a knowing. It was like an unthought known. Yeah. Like I knew it, but I didn't know it. Um, and, I, and I really wonder because I didn't get diagnosed later um, until like 2021. Is that right? When I was diagnosed um, January and I, 
like had pain for 16 years and every patient who came in for a consult, I identified with them. But I feel like I was really so delved into my work and making a difference and being a mom and operating that, you know, I did what I think a lot of female doctors do is that we don't take care of ourselves and we ignore ourselves or or clinicians or those in the workforce too. We just help other people and like minimize our own needs. And I did do that. And then when my daughter, my older daughter was nine, oh my gosh, she'd be curled up in her ball in bed. She'd be up most nights, terrible gut issues. And I'm like, I know what this is. It's endo. And it was, I got her her surgery first. She didn't want to have it. You know, we did the whole multidisciplinary approach and she really wanted to get into college before she had her excision surgery. Um, and, you know, it's important for her to be part of the, like the, the, the path to getting her better. So we, so when I took her to the OR, cause I suspected it, every doctor was like, she doesn't have it. You're an endosurgeon. That's why you think your daughter has it. I mean, the resistance I met, we went to the best of the best doctors. They're like, she, what do they say? <coughs> She's, um, uh, precocious. Um, like, I mean, head, head, heads of the department, you know, that was a, a head at, um, at Mount Sinai, um, of GI or like one of the head people and like, no one, people like dismiss the idea of endometriosis, but I, it was this knowing, this knowing. And it was like, I was even doubting myself, but I knew it until the surgeon came out and said she had endo. And it was only then where I'm like, I need to trust my gut literally. And, you know, I'm like, I'll be here soon (laughs) for my surgery, you know, I think we do things, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have kids and I'm fortunate enough to have two beautiful daughters. And I think we often take care of those loved ones around us, whether it's a sibling, a best friend, a partner, it doesn't matter. We often, I don't know if it's societally, culturally, whatever it is, we take care of other people before we take care of ourselves. So in that case, you know, it's like taking care of my my beautiful daughter. Yeah, I think so many people are in this in healthcare, especially just empaths, and I think that often comes with putting yourself down, down lower. It, mm-hmm. it happens all the time. Yeah. What were preceding symptoms for you? And because we, as an endosurgeon, right? Of course, when it comes to ourselves, it's like all of a sudden you don't know anything. But mm-hmm. what were what were some of your preceding symptoms? Or did you have hindsight that you had stuff when you were a teenager? And yeah. No, I didn't have hindsight as a teenager. Um, or, and, and parenthetically, I really do think generationally, like, I think society is just different. There's so many toxins in our products, the glyphosates, the mm-hmm. just it, from an industrialized standpoint, I think the world is just everyone's more upregulated because of the easy access. I think the foods, there's just more crap in it and sugars and corn sugars and anything than when I grew up. Um, So I do see like the moms, let's say some had symptoms, but not as bad as what they're seeing in their daughters. It's different for everybody, but overall I do see that. Um, But for me, it was just terrible abdominal pain um, and it was like, it led to tight muscles and the muscle mm-hmm. pain was, was horrific, was yeah. absolutely horrific for me. So for me, it manifested musculoskeletally, um, more than anything. Yeah. Which probably makes it very confusing <laughs> to try to say, okay, is this endo, right? It's so pronounced like infertility, painful periods. Mm-hmm. But it's so much more than that. So especially with the musculoskeletal, as an athlete too, it makes sense that you would question that, you know, is this a driver or is this secondary? Right. Because for me, I was an athlete. I was a triathlete. I had tore my right gastroc, my calf muscle, my left calf muscle. I had fallen in basketball on my coccyx. So I had a coccyx injury. Mm -hmm. Like I beat my body down exercising. So, you know, 
it it's like you know what is it the um the uh, shoemaker has like the cobbler wears terrible shoes or yeah. Like it, it's interesting there. I was just in this article on um, Monday with my daughter and to raise awareness about endometriosis and um, in the Washington post and the uh, writer called me a couple of days before it was going to be released. I think like Friday morning before the Monday release, she's like, you know, we just want to clarify and make sure that it like, how could you have gotten 16 years in pain when you're an endosurgeon? And, you know, I explained the whole concept of the gaslighting. And it was really interesting that the writer, um, it was so fun working on this article with her. She said, I totally saw, see it. She said that she once interviewed, I think it was a neurosurgeon who had terrible headaches, who never advocated for, an, uh, you know, a CT scan or an MRI, whatever you do to look for brain cancer. She had brain cancer, you know, oh it's like, God. you just, you don't, you know, and she was going to doctors. She told me this story. So it's it, apparently it was published and it's like, you don't recognize things in yourself. I, I, I don't know. And I was gaslit, you know, I was asking, um, doctors and I, I was like do you think I have it because I didn't want to believe my there's this not even believing yourself because you look normal right and you don't see yeah. endo on imaging typically and like a male doctor is like oh you're manifesting your patient's pain and I'm like okay you know <laughs> like when I think about it it's crazy but it's um that's what happened yeah it's a very real reality and that's yeah. what our, probably our patients are going through all the time Mm -hmm. It's very frustrating. I do want to talk about the future direction of endo. We know that endo is changing and you've yeah. been a big part of that with working with Shannon and her team with endo what and the below the belt film, yeah. which has been, yeah, long production, you know, or a long process to get it yeah. produced. And especially with this film, where it's gone is has been huge. And we know it just it just aired on PBS last week. So where do you see the direction of endo heading with everything that you've been involved in and the film? Yeah, I think Shannon and I've been working together. Maybe we were just in um, Israel and London together. We we're spending a lot of time. together. I'm like, how long have we been like trying to tackle this issue from an outside the box perspective? And I think it's like 16 or 17 years. I can't remember exactly. Oh, 15, a long time. Mm -hmm. um, no longer than that. Anyways. And um, like I have a gl like a glimmer in my, I get excited when you are asking me that question because I really think sky is the limit. We've been working so hard. I mean that, like we've just been trying to tackle a problem from upside down, backwards, right, left, just trying to figure out how to raise awareness. And it's first of all, it's just been so fun. While at the same time, it's like I want to like bang my head against the wall, <laughs> you know. But all of a sudden, this train, it's like all of a sudden, it's like I mean. It's really yes. moving. We met with NIH last, was it, what was that, in DC two weeks ago after the the premiere launch for the PBS. And we met with like bipartisan uh, support people and really asking for a hefty amount for funding and raising awareness. And people are really interested at this point, you know, that was the first coalition of endometriosis. And they like, I got a text today, they want us to be part of like, decision making, like the four of us who were there. So um, I, I honestly don't see an end in what we can achieve. Like, I just think the future seems so bright. Um, and um, I, I hope in my lifetime that you know, people are diagnosed by pediatricians and there's a lot that needs to be done. We need enough surgeons. We can get a test and be diagnosed with endo. We need to get a bunch of surgeons. And one of the things that I said in the meeting and someone came up to me afterwards, I said, we need to divide OB and GYN into two separate fields because yes. GYN should be a surgical substance specialty. OB should just be obstetrics and, you know, pregnancy. And I said, how are we going to meet the need of these 200 million who have endo? I forget how many in the United States that just translates to, but it's a lot. How are we going to do that? Like, unless you change it. And she came up to me, she's like, I have never heard that before. She's like, mm hmm. So it's like, there's so many problems to tackle. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're relentless. We're not stopping.
That's awesome. And yeah. yeah, you are so right. Even since my eyes were open to it, 2016, 2017, it's just been massive the last couple of years. And it's mm -hmm. very exciting. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of new avenues that people are exploring. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that treatment of the lesions is a, is a huge part of treating endometriosis. And we do know that the recurrence rate is lower in those who get a, a true excision surgery versus an ablation surgery. I think they always mm -hmm. pretty much end up with excision. But a lot of the research is not focused just on treatment aspects, meaning, you know, ablation versus excision, but there's there's genetic testing coming out, there's better mm -hmm. understanding of phenotypes, there's researchers looking at different roles that are producing these inflammatory cascades mm -hmm. that are generating endo. And in the changing landscape, what I have noticed, and I'm curious to your thoughts on this, is with all of these different avenues that they're looking at, because we've been so stuck on hormone suppression and surgery, it's been a hard thing for people to open up and understand that there's so many avenues to explore that I've noticed a lot of resistance in some of that. And I was talking to Dr. Leonardi about this, and my thought is with so many people that are advocates now, and in the community, whether it's physicians, patients, advocates in general, it's hard to trust something new because you've been so let down for so long. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Have you noticed some of that happening? What do you think about the different avenues of research that's happening? And is it in the right direction? I think what will be fascinating is how do you prevent you know, end up from turning on. I think that's going to be a fast, once we can understand what's inducing it. I mean, we do know some things like, you know, we know the genetic, we know exposure in utero to dioxins, and there's probably a plethora of other um, exposures that then induce this change that, that causes endo. But um, it'll be fascinating once I think they can isolate it from a genetic standpoint, and how do you turn it off? That'll be utterly fascinating. So I think, I think the people who personally are looking at endo from a, oh, it's retrograde menstruation. Let's figure out the retrograde menstruation. In my opinion, I think that they will never figure out endo at all. Um, I definitely think it's inflammatory needs to be approached. I think it's, um, you know, why is it? I think it's the, the, the central nervous system. I think it's, I, I think looking at it probably like a cancer expression in my mind is going to be the answer to, to, to treatment um, because there's so many overlaps. And, and we do know that those with endo are a higher likelihood for two types of ovarian cancer. I think that that is going to be the approach. But right now, there's so much funding and research going into the wrong ideology of endo so but but the researchers are so fixated on this retrograde menstruation that they can't think outside the box but i think if there's more funding for the disease will and this is what we were talking about in dc 2 weeks ago there'll be more people who are interested like if we can get researchers who because those with endo have higher likelihood of migraines higher likelihood of autoimmune diseases higher likelihood of all these different things if we can get those kind of researchers who are, are involved in other things <coughs> who then can look at endo like with that outside the box lens i think that's where we're going to figure it out yeah Personally. yeah i agree completely mm -hmm. and i want to bring this up the japanese research and I think it got a lot of bad rap because of too much excitement from news reporters who have no, no idea about endo. Uh -huh. And I and I did read the research article because I it I just like honing in on those things when there's so much like talk and like there has to be more information of this. And right. I think it got looked at because the abstract they stated, you know, retrograde menstruation, but it really wasn't about that. And I, I don't know if you read the article the or not. The bacteria one? The fusobac yeah, the fusobacterium yeah, yeah. article. Yeah, I'll tell you my thoughts. Um, there you do. Yeah. Did you read the article? I, I only read the blurb about it in yeah. Washington Post. Yeah. 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 
Um, but I think I can't wait to read. If you have it, the article, will you send I, it to me? I will send it to you because I paid the thirty dollars. Because and that's the only article I've ever bought in my yeah. life because I was so interested. Anything that creates that much commotion with such extreme yeah. viewpoints, I'm like, there's always more to that. So correct. I'm going to tell you my thoughts and then I'm, I'm very much looking forward to hear your thoughts, you know, off the podcast. Yeah. Um, but it got a lot of rap because of the abstract. And I think they, honestly, I think that researchers probably could have done the abstract a bit better, but created a lot of talk, which is good for endo. Mm -hmm. the, what the research was about was actually looking at a ba the bacteria and they didn't know that they were going to look at that bacteria they just looked yeah. at different databases and then their tissue samples and found okay. that that one matched both and then yeah. they they put together like point a to point b as to like how the presence of this bacteria can then trigger gene expression of a specific gene found in endo that creates you know tgf beta and uh interleukin 6 and all these cascades oh. that then changed a tissue so their yeah. hypothesis was exactly what you're talking about, about what's turning things on and off and creating this, this cascade of events, essentially. And yes, is it usable right now? Absolutely not. But mm -hmm. it was looking at that as to what's triggering that cascade. Right. And, right. and what their hypothesis was correct in mice. But you can take that and say, you know, let's look at this more in depth. And what is it about this bacteria? There's other studies that have looked at bacteria as well. It's not the first one. But then what we can do is ask questions about not treating it with antibiotics, but that's obviously the natural conclusion if you're doing an experiment, right. wouldn't you want to treat it with something? So they showed it worked. That's probably not real life in endo. It's absolutely not real life in endo. These people with endo have probably taken these antibiotics before. What about people with endo are more prone to these opportunistic pathogens? You know, is it something that's there from the microbiome from right. birth? Is it uh -huh. different between people that are born by C-section or by vaginal delivery? Is mm -hmm. it because there's so many co-infections and delay of care that they end up being treated with so many antibiotics that this is more present? Like, what is it about that? And the other ones that they've looked at that are triggering this response. And that yeah. was sort of my takeaway from it. Um, so yeah. I'm curious to hear yours. But just in connecting that, I thought it was really interesting. And I think mm -hmm. the abstract could have been better. But it did get a lot of hype. So people are talking I, about it. That was one of, actually, my sister, I was on the plane coming back from D.C. when my sister sent that to me. My sister sends me anything. I don't, I don't read the news since 9-11. I'm like, <laughs> um, so my sister texted it to me as I was about to take off. And I, I was like, I got so excited when I read it because to me, I think it's, for me, I do think that there's something going on in the gut and again, I think this goes back to why my patients who do do integrate an integrative approach to boost the gut and the dysbiosis do better than any of my patients. Because I think that maybe there's something that's being triggered and then that's triggering on like the predisposition to having, um, you know, at, at, like someone's predisposed, right? There's a genetic link yes. to having endo. Then that's something in the gut what whether it's a bacteria or it's like um too much of this too little a dysbiosis yeah. essentially is yeah. then activating that gene it's the same thing like someone who has celiac right mm -hmm. we know that they have like the hla dq2 or dq6 gene what turns on that gene it's usually like someone has a food poisoning or some inf gut infection that causes some kind of dysbiosis and then it triggers that gene Yes. And so I do think it's like a very similar thing. And I think that I, 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 I'm not on social media all that much, actually very little, but I did see a couple of people being like, not so fast. I'm like, oh, I actually think that this is fascinating and really yes. could lead to other, to, to really figuring out what it is. I thought that was out of everything I've read in the last almost decade and a half, the most interesting and again i just yeah. read the synopsis i i can't i just have been so busy um yeah with work i haven't had a chance to actually read the article but i'm looking it's like on my to-do list to read it yeah 
it was really interesting. And I think it's because it's the out of the box thinking, right? Uh-huh. And, and get and just like you said, where research should go is finding the different genes associated with it and biomarkers. But on top of that, what are all the things that can trigger those to turn on or off? And mm-hmm. there can probably be thousands of things, right? And it's probably going to take years, hopefully not, but maybe, yeah. you know, before we really, really understand. But I do think that that is a great direction to go because nothing's taking away surgery anytime in the future, for sure. And mm-hmm. we know excision surgery is going to remove the lesion, which also promotes inflammation. But we have especially if there's a focus on teens, you know, they have a long life to live if they have surgery at a young age, which is great. We might prevent a lot of overlapping pain syndromes and mental health issues and all of that. But that also leaves a lot of room for things to grow back. And right now, I don't think we have great research like longitudinally to better understand the, the people who have repeat surgeries because people are maybe finally getting the surgery in their 30s or 40s. And so I just am curious as to when this is more, when people become more aware of endometriosis, what it is, catching it in teens, does that lead to immediate surgery? Does it lead to management until they're older? Actually, that's a great question for for you. Yeah. Yeah, It's a great question since my favorite, I mean, I love all my patients, but one of my favorite patient populations are teens, 20s, because we're really, you know, hitting them early to really change the trajectory of their lives. Um, So usually when people come, even though I am a surgeon, I really view the initial consult as education and awareness and helping them make good decisions for themselves. And everyone is very different. But typically, even my teens, even if you've had six months of period pain where you're hunched in a ball and you're constipated, and the constipation most often doesn't start at the time of one's period because the hormones start to kick in usually three years before the period even starts. So people are already usually three years into squeezing and straining their muscles, even if they've only had six months of period pain. First place I send people is pelvic floor PT, even a teenager. And I get them into PT beforehand. And um, I get them into meditation and mind. I mean, I'm doing a similar, whatever's appropriate for that patient. And I will do all that same stuff to downregulate them. And then, um, you know, do surgery and then continue all of that. Gut, nutrition, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I've been doing teens for like 17 years and I, I'm not seeing much of a reoperation. You know, some do, obviously. I, I'd say reoperation in my hands is about five or 10%. Um, I'm not talking about like someone has endo and then five years later they develop an endometrioma. That's a totally different story. Yes. I'm talking about the recurrence of endometriosis. Um, uh, but I, I think it's um, picking them up early and it's still applying a multidisciplinary approach. And, you know, if, if, if someone just has surgery, have excision surgery, they go back to eating pizza, pasta, canned food, boxed food, not sleeping well, um, not taking care of themselves, you know, slathering chemical products, with like crap that's like EWG environmental working group, like F or G grade, those are pseudo estrogens. Like they're, and they're living in an, in an inflammatory environment. It's they're going to have more pain, even if they have a spot of endo, it's just like, there's, there's so much to it than, um, yeah, I think you have to live in, and just like someone who has Hashimoto's thyroiditis, like you have to, eat in a anti-inflammatory way and live in an anti-inflammatory lifestyle to do your best with that disease process. And the world isn't getting easier to live in because of marketing and the fake foods. And it's hard to determine what's what, like you mentioned earlier, you you just didn't have a lot of these things in your environment growing up that we have now. And it's, it's almost makes it harder. Yeah. To navigate because now it's not just what food you're eating. It's what's what's been done to the food that you're eating. Um, Yeah. So there's so much like nothing comes into my house. That's not organic. 
like no product comes into my house that isn't, you know, EWG, you know, like maybe we'll do a four, but usually it's a one or a two, maybe a three, mm-hmm. but you know, because I don't want to turn anything on for them. Thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing all of this. Like I said, I, you give such a good, well-rounded view of the multidisciplinary care. You, you know so much more, I think, than many health practitioners about these other things that happen in not just not just endometriosis. Yeah, so thank you so much. Anything you want to share? What I would say is really trust your intuition, trust your gut. If you're considering excision surgery, really talk to the doctor about, really do your research on the doctor, um, you know, asking them how many specimens do they remove typically, even if they say they're an excision specialist, because often, you know, some people will call themselves an excision specialist, they'll do one excisional biopsy and they'll ablate the rest. So do a lot of research. Um, and uh, the same thing, like when it comes to pelvic floor PT, I have some patients who are like, yeah, oh, I tried, it didn't work, you know? And I'm like, well, how many sessions did you do? And I'm like, well, how long were your sessions? And then I say, did your physical therapist ask you to do a Kegel? She's like, yeah, and it hurts so much. And I'm like, well, you don't want to do Kegels when your muscles are tight. So it's like, I have to, you really have to ask a lot of questions to get the right answers as a doctor, getting it from a patient. And the same thing, the patient should ask those questions of their physician who they're, you know, want to entrust their lives with and, and trust your gut and know your knowing and trust your intuition and know you can get better. No, I'm not trying to like sell my book, but I think my book, the reason I made the book is for a resource for everyone, no matter where they were to drive the care that they need. So they can take it to their gynecologist and say, listen, they talk about pelvic floor PT. Can I have a prescription for pelvic floor PT? They take it to the GI. They have a whole chapter on bacterial overgrowth. Can you test me for that? So I bought it as a manual for patients to advocate for their care so they can be heard. Because once we as patients are all being heard, the medical industry and will change. So I wrote the book to help empower patients to beat endo and to help change the narrative of the disease. That, that's why I wrote the book. <laughs> I do agree that people should buy beating endo, especially if you're new into this disease to really understand. You may not have all of the resource of, resources available to you locally, but by learning and understanding one of the wonderful things about COVID, there's few, but one of the wonderful things is people do telehealth now. And so you actually often have more access than you did previous. So Mm -hmm. there are people out there to help with that, but it really is, like you said, a guide to better understanding this disease. And you may not know what you don't know. And then you read the book and you see the story or the situation and you're like, oh yeah, I've had that for seven years. So, Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. We'll put everything in the show notes where people can find you, where people can find your book. And thank you so much again. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. So fun, Jandra. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Endo Unplugged presented by I Care Better. We hope you found our discussion insightful and empowering. Remember, you are not alone in your journey with endometriosis. Together, we can raise awareness, support one another, and drive positive change in the understanding and management of this condition. Tune in weekly to I Care Better Endo Unplugged for more inspiring conversations, expert insights, and practical tips to help you navigate life with endometriosis. If you have any questions, suggestions, or personal stories you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us on our website, icarebetter.com, or social media platforms at icarebetter. And let's continue this conversation. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Together, we can make a difference for those living with endometriosis. Endometriosis.